will read to us from the Bible and then Philip will come and speak to us. Our Bible reading today is from Acts 1. Oh, Acts 1, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> Acts 1, verses 1 to 11, and can be found on pages uh, 1092. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote... In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the, gift of, for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates that the father has set by his own authority but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After this, he said, he was, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way as you have seen him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Great to be with you. Let's pray together, shall we? Loving Lord, we thank you for your spirit that caused these words to be written. We thank you that your same spirit is among us tonight as we open up your scriptures. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will speak to our heads and our hearts, that we might hear your voice to us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It seems that at the moment, as a country, we're divided into two distinct groups. No, no, not like that. No, 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 we're not mentioning that tonight. Okay, we're not going there. No, 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 no. Not those two groups. Um, uh, these two groups. We're, in, it, we're divided into two groups. Basically, those who've seen Avengers Endgame uh, and those who haven't. Yeah? So, so I mean, actually, that, that, that second group is... Uh, can we just do with those who've seen Avengers Endgame and those who haven't? Brilliant, thanks very much indeed. Um, actually, that second group is divided again into two groups. That's those who are desperate to see it and are frantically trying to avoid the plot spoilers, and those who haven't seen it, don't want to see it, and couldn't care less. So there's a bit of a subdivision going on there. You can, um, uh, you can tell me it's later which group you're in. Um, now, I have seen the film, but, and here's the confession, uh, I haven't seen all the other films in this... Sp- <laughs> in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, okay? So, so if you don't know, by the way, the Marvel Cinematic Universe is a series of 22 films based on the characters from the Marvel comics, all living in this universe of superheroes and battles between good and evil, life and death. Now, because I hadn't seen all the films before I went to see Endgame, I was working on the assumption that when I went to watch Endgame with the boys last weekend, I could simply ask them, who's that, what's going on, at appropriate moments in the film. However, I have to report that that proposal met with a level of disapproval that required me instead to go away and read a number of articles and try and work out what was going on, try and capture the story so far. And there was one plot line I particularly needed to get hold of. That was from Avengers Infinity War, which was like the pre-story to Endgame, in which, I get this from my kids are going to kill me, in which the evil Thanos managed to collect the six Infinity Stones and destroy half of all known life. And so Endgame picks up at that bleak point where the previous film left off. 
Now, we're going to come back to Endgame uh, later on. But for now, I want to suggest that the dynamics for us tonight, as we start a sermon series on the book of Acts, are actually quite similar. Because we find ourselves, I want to suggest, in a big, multi-layered story. A story described not in 22 films, but in the 66 books that we receive as the Christian scriptures. This is a story of creation and recreation, good and evil, life and death. There are moments of triumph and tragedy, humor and grief, betrayal and bravery. But there's one particular story we need to be aware of as we launch into the book of Acts tonight, one pre-story that is relevant above all others, and that is the former book which Luke, our author, refers to in the first verse of our reading just now. You see, Luke, the educated doctor-turned-historian, reminds his patron Theophilus, probably a Roman believer, that this first book, he says, contained what Jesus did and taught while he was on earth. But actually, he doesn't quite say that. Did you notice that? He actually says in verse 1, "...all that Jesus began to do and teach." The implication is that Jesus, the acts of Jesus, didn't finish with his teaching, his death and his resurrection. You know, instead they were to carry on in the story that followed. That although physically absent, Jesus was still at work in all that was to come. So while the book of Acts is the story of the first 30 years of the church's life, it's actually still the story of Jesus. In fact, Tom Wright, writing on these verses, says that instead of being called the Acts of the Apostles, which is what the full title of the book is, the book should instead be called the Acts of Jesus 2. Perhaps that's one for the film. And in these verses of introduction, if you have your Bibles open on page 1092, it would be really helpful as we look at it together. We're basically going to look at the first five verses tonight. I think what we can see is kind of seeing three themes that Luke is going to say are going to prove key to this story that we're invited to explore. Three themes that are going to be central to the story that follows. Theme number one, the risen Jesus. Theme number two, the coming kingdom. And theme number three, the promised spirit. Yeah. If you're here tonight just exploring faith or working out what Christian faith is all about, I want to say you're really welcome. I'm thrilled you're here. And I hope you're going to kind of grab a sense as we look at this story together of what it is about the Christian story that has gripped and inspired people for 2,000 years. If you're here tonight as a follower of Jesus, I hope you're going to be inspired afresh to play your part in God's big story. And the good news is the Marvel Cinematic Universe makes a few other appearances as well. So let's get going, shall we? Okay, first of all, the risen Jesus. In setting the scene for all that is to follow, it is striking in these verses that Jesus again points to the proof of the resurrection of Jesus. He did that at the end of his gospel. We have the story of the road to Emmaus, the story of Jesus eating with his disciples. But here we have it again here. Look with me at verse 3. After his suffering, he, that is Jesus, showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appealed to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God one occasion while he was eating with them, and it goes on. Do you see what Luke's pointing to? He's pointing onto something that isn't just a kind of one-off resurrection appearance, but a number of appearances, a period of 40 days between um, Passover and Pentecost. And this wasn't a ghostly appearance, you know, as if kind of Jesus appears from afar like a, like a ghost. This is, this is a sort of appearance. He sat and eat with, ate with his disciples. He shared a meal with them. Luke is saying, you know, they saw him, they ate with him, they touched him. Luke is setting out his stall here for what this next chapter is all about. It is based on the truth of the risen Jesus. All the stuff that happens in the book of Acts, all that we're going to read about in the weeks to come, only happens because Jesus is risen from the dead. You see, without the resurrection of Jesus, not as a dream or an imagination, but as a fact of history, there is nothing. And this would be a very short book. Jesus would have stayed one of the many numerous failed messiahs. The disciples would have gone back to fishing, 
and the cross would have remained a hideous sign of Roman execution. With the truth of the risen Jesus in their heads and their hearts, however, the disciples were changed and ready to take on the world. I tell you when this really came home to me. I've had the privilege of going to a number of the places that are mentioned in the book of Acts, a number of places that Paul went to uh, on his missionary journeys. I remember standing in uh, the main square of Philippi, the first city Paul visited in Europe, uh, just in uh, kind of eastern Greece now today. Is that it was then a, a huge centre of Roman power and wealth, hugely kind of impressive sight. And I remember thinking as I was standing there, you know, Paul had just set sail from Turkey, arrives in Philippi. The only thing he had to commend him, the only thing he had to offer in this place of power and authority was that Jesus was risen from the dead. And because Jesus was risen from the dead, it wasn't Caesar who was Lord, it was Jesus who was Lord. That's the only thing he had to offer. It was, it was Paul against the Roman Empire with the belief that Jesus was risen. That was it. Or here in Athens, I've been to the Areopagus just below the Parthenon here. Impressive in its ruined state today, but awe-inspiring then. As we, with the group of pilgrims, sang, Thine be the glory. I thought that the only thing that Paul had to go on in front of the academics and the philosophers of the age was that Jesus was risen from the dead. It's the only thing he had to go on. You see, the book of Acts came out of one truth. Jesus is risen. And that makes all the difference in the world. I'll give you a story slightly closer from home. Many of you will have seen the sad news that just before Easter, former Durham students Toby and Millie Saville died in a road accident in Santorini, Greece. Amidst all the grief that followed... It was deeply moving to note the register of, to register the note of hope that flowed from the faith in the risen Jesus that Toby and Millie had. Millie's father said, Toby and Millie were passionate about their Christian faith and we are being sustained by the same sure hope of Easter resurrection. The church where they worshipped in South London said, we are comforted by the hope we have in Jesus hope that completely shaped Toby and Millie's lives. This hope is in Jesus who died for our sins and rose from the dead so that all those who believe in him will have life after death. Those are not easy words to say, but they point to the fact that at the darkest time, the resurrection of Jesus as a fact of history makes all the difference in the world. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, death is still so final. I don't want to spoil the plot, but someone does die in Endgame. And there is a very moving funeral scene. In the new world ushered in by Jesus, a real world, death does not have the final word because Jesus is risen. Let's prepare to see the difference that the risen Jesus makes in the weeks ahead as we fold, follow the story together. Theme number one, the risen Jesus. The second theme Luke points to is the coming kingdom. What did the risen Jesus speak about with his disciples? Look with me at verse three. After uh, v- verse four, on one occasion while he was eating with them, sorry, at verse three, end of verse three, he appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. He spoke about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, to understand it, it refers to the growing rule and reign of God as people confess Jesus as king. As people confess Jesus as king, the kingdom of God grows. And Jesus had told parables about the kingdom of God growing. He used illustrations of a little mustard seed that grows into a huge tree that pointed to this growth from small beginnings into something amazing. The book of Acts is the story of that coming true. How from this little kind of band of followers, the, 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ grew to thousands upon thousands, grew from Jerusalem to Samaria to Asia Minor to Europe and finally to Rome, the capital of the empire, the known world. 
Uh, note, by the way, that the, the followers of Jesus have got new names, not individual names, but they're no longer called disciples. They're now called apostles. If disciples refers to them as learners and followers, apostles means literally those who are sent out. That's the dynamic of the book of Acts. It's this kingdom growing. It isn't come to Jerusalem and find out what God has done here. It's go out to every nation with the good news of Jesus. Uh, Apologies to all the clever physicists here, but I think this is accurate. You can tell me later if it's not. I, I think it's the move from centripetal mission, which is kind of gathering in, to centrifugal mission, which is going out. And here's the really exciting bit. This coming kingdom the book of Acts describes is not just for historical interest. It's actually our story too. It's actually our story, this. How come? Two ways. Uh, First of all, it's our story because this is the story about how the good news of Jesus spread so far that one day it reached these shores. And not long ago, just a few miles away in the uh, Roman settler of Binchester, uh, the archaeologists found a Christian ring dating back to some time in the 200s. That means that within 150 years of the book of Acts, and very probably, in my view, earlier, the gospel had reached County Durham. And it started here. And secondly, it's a story that continues to the present day because we're able to play a part in it. You see, here's the thing about the Marvel Cinematic Universe it's a fab story. It's one that can grip us and inspire us and entertain us, but we can't ever play a part in it. We can't do anything to act our way into it. But the story of the mission of God that we see so vibrantly depicted in the book of Acts is one we're invited to play our part by witnessing to Jesus where we are. Let me tell you where I was uh, on Easter Sunday, worshipping with a family. It was here. Uh, It it is a church on a housing estate just south of Great Yarmouth in Norfolk. Uh, The church building, you can see, was pretty unpromising. It's kind of 1950s utilitarian design. What was amazing was what was going on there. See, God's really at work. It's a community being reached and served with the love of Jesus through debt counselling and a food bank and youth work, and people are coming to know Jesus. God's on the move. I'm personally just really excited that in a few short weeks, a great bunch of students from Cranmer Hall, where I serve, are going to be going out to serve and lead in churches up and down the country. God's on the move. The story of Acts, you see, isn't just about what God did then, and isn't that interesting. It points to what God can do as you and I play our part in God's story. You see, this is our story, your story and my story, in our college or our course, in our school or in our work. You can be part of what God is doing. As you pray for your friends, as you forgive, as Jesus forgave, as you love without limits, as you choose the humbler part, as you serve Jesus, you're part of the coming kingdom. As we're going to find out looking at Acts this term, this is a great story to be part of. It's a story of the risen Jesus. It's a story of the coming kingdom. Thirdly, it's a story of the promised spirit. You see, the really striking thing, I don't know if you noticed about verses 4 and 5, is that Jesus does not send the apostles out straight away. Not even after his ascension, which is alluded to in these verses and narrated in full in verses uh, that follow. Now, instead, what he does, he commands the apostles to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promised Spirit. You see, what it is, is the Holy Spirit makes the physically absent Jesus spiritually real. I'll say that again. The, physically, the, the Holy Spirit makes the physically absent Jesus spiritually real. So that wherever they go, the apostles will know Jesus with them and working through them. The book of Acts is the story of a people working with a power that is not of their own, but a power they've received. What gives them courage and hope and perseverance and belief? It's the Holy Spirit who's working through them. We were talking as a family at lunch today about the characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and whether they are superheroes 
Yes, we were. You were, you were there. Uh, oh, I wonder why I bothered. We were talking about whether they were superheroes or whether they were just people who had superpowers because of the special suits that they wear. Yeah? I can't say I was commenting on the discussion with high levels of knowledge, but I was listening carefully. I think the answer is a bit of both. But what is undeniable is that most people in the Marvel Cinematic Universe don't have these special powers. They can only watch and rely on those who do. And here's the really exciting thing. The Holy Spirit wasn't just a gift promised to the apostles as if they were the superheroes of church history. The Holy Spirit is for us all and gives us the power today to play our part in God's story. The Spirit helps us receive God's love and forgiveness deep down in our hearts. The Spirit helps us to receive and understand God's truth. The Spirit gives us courage to live with Jesus as Lord. The Spirit gives us strength against temptation. The Spirit gives us hope in the face of death. The Spirit whispers the words of Jesus in our ears. I'm with you. Luke reports Jesus saying, John baptized you with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You know that word baptism, baptize in Greek, it just means drenched. John drenched his disciples in the water of the river Jordan. Jesus is promising the apostles being drenched with the Spirit of God. Now being drenched here in the UK, let's face it, is nothing special, is it? I mean, you only have to walk outside in November and you get it for free, you know. In the dryness of the Middle East, being drenched is an amazing and refreshing experience. The picture you see behind me is taken from the shores of the Dead Sea, the hottest part of Israel. It's taken from a little spring called En Gedi. A natural spring where within sight of the Dead Sea and the salt and in the midst of the desert, you can bathe, and we've done that, in cool, fresh water. That's just a picture of the life in the Spirit of God. That's what Jesus is promising his disciples, of being drenched with the life of God. The question is, will we sit under the waterfall? Will we open ourselves up to the work of the Spirit? Will we say tonight, Lord, I cannot do it on your own. I need your Spirit to fill me afresh. Back to end game. It's a story that can move us and inspire us, but it's not going to transform us. The transformation story is one that Luke is launching in these first verses of the book of Acts. It's a story based on the world-changing miracle that Jesus was raised from the dead. It's a story of good news spreading and a kingdom coming. It's a story of ordinary people being given power from above by the Holy Spirit. And it's therefore, it's a story for us. It's a story for us invited to see the difference that the risen Jesus makes today. A story for us invited to play our part in building the coming kingdom in the places where God has called us. It's a story for us invited to receive God's power for the life and the mission he calls us to. I want to respond to that invitation with a big yes. Will you?